As we look at the book of Philippians, we also are recognizing because we study in this inductive way, we need to review a little bit, we need to have context a little bit, especially if you're new to us this morning. Um, We want to be able to help you with that, so you'll notice that in just a minute we're going to go through that. But over the next few minutes, we are going to cover truly some great, interesting, powerful, and deep truths. This text that we're studying a few weeks ago and now we start again today is one of the most profound and clear texts of the Bible concerning the work of Christ. In fact, there's an outline in this text that outlines some of the most monumental truths that a human being could ever understand. And I'm not, and I'm not kidding. This is much greater than Einstein's theory of relativity. I'm not kidding. Much more important than humans knowing Einstein's theory of relativity is that we would understand some of the things that are here in Philippians chapter 2. Now, I was texting back and forth with Pastor Jason this week, and um, he was telling me something, and there was something that really, he doesn't know I'm about to do this, there was something that really surprised him, and as we were texting back and forth, and he said, yeah, I just can't believe this, and then he texted this. So, there's Pastor Jason, and what does it look like? You know, his mind is blowing. You know, we, we, we have this concept in life that sometimes out of the ordinary, there are things that come to our consciousness that we are amazed by. Sometimes we're dumbstruck by it. We just can't believe it. And sometimes those are minor things, like one of the things that he and I were talking about this week. It wasn't really that big a deal, but the way he was expressing his surprise was this. But many of you remember the old movie, While You Were Sleeping. And, um, you know, sweet old nostalgic film, sweet story, you know, pretty, pretty funny. Um, but in that movie is this interesting character named Joe Jr. And some of you remember Joe Jr. He's the guy that's always wanting Lucy to go out with him. And he's describing something in one of the dialogues. And as I was studying this, I was just thinking about these mind-blowing things. You know, different things matter to different people and di- different levels of importance. But he said, you know, it's kind of like when you see your first Trans Am. You know, that's a mind blower for some people. And to Joe Joe Jr., that was a mind blower. But let's take it up to far beyond a Trans Am. How many of you have ever stood at the edge of the Grand Canyon? Y'all, I remember as a 10-year-old standing at the edge of the Grand Canyon with my grandparents and going, wow! I mean, just truly astounding. It's so big and it's so deep. You talk about a hole in the ground. And what's interesting is the ground is very flat all around it. It's just a big, huge plain. And then there's a mile deep hole in the ground with every imaginable color at sunset. The beauty of the Grand Canyon causes us to be wowed. I saw it 25 years later. And I had this same effect. It had the same effect on me. I took Cheryl and Andrea while Marcy was in a meeting down in Phoenix. We drove up to the Grand Canyon, and I stood there again many years later just looking at it, and it practically had the same effect. How about this one? Some of you have been to Niagara Falls, and you've seen the beauty and the majesty, the greatness of that fall. And you've seen and felt the thundering water pouring over that fall. Maybe some of you have even gone up to the edge and stood right there. And as you stand there and you look at it, you, you just feel the rumble of the water moving. And it has an awe-inspiring effect. Some of you crazy people got in one of the boats and went up underneath the fall or near to it. But it has this dumbfounding effect. How about this? Some of you have gone up in the Empire State Building or the World Trade Center before it was destroyed. Do you remember the first time you looked out one of the tall buildings that you climbed up into in Chicago or in New York? I'll never forget being up there, coming out of the elevator and looking out over the city, and I was just dumbfounded at how beautiful and how big and how intricate, how many buildings and how many millions of people 
We're all there. It was truly amazing. And then at night, it's a whole different story. You're just amazed when you're not used to that. We have people in our church that have been up to Lake Louise in the upper Rockies. And the same effect, a dumbfounding effect. Let me bring it a little bit closer to home. For some, you hold your baby for the first time. And there's just not words for that. For the first time, you cradle that little life and you think, this came from me. As God blows our mind with glorious things, he lets us in to his glory. He shares with us his power. He shares with us through the beauty of his majesty from mountains to the things that he's even given us the ability to create like a city or some beautiful thing or a child. God has shared his majesty and this should indeed blow us away. Well, similarly this morning, I want you to see the great majesty of these concepts that we're going to look at. And I pray that you will not sit there and just go, wow, that's really amazing. My prayer is that the Holy Spirit will transform your thinking and your life and your behavior as you come to gaze into the majesty of his word. You know, we have this phrase that we often use. Well, you know, the real crux of the matter is this. And as I was studying this this week, I kept thinking about that phrase, the crux of the matter. You know, what is the crux of the matter? That means the most important thing, where it really comes down to it. And the word crux has to do with like crossroads. In fact, you see a little bit of a word there, the crucifix, the idea of two coming together, the pinpoint that is there. Well, we often need to know what is the crux of the matter. I want to say to you that Philippians chapter 2 has the crux of the matter for everything. Everything important to your life is found and it rises and it falls on what God did through the second person of the Trinity, the Son of God, as he died on the cross and he rose again, bringing redemption to his fallen creation. Now, this is the crux of every matter. This affects everything. And so this morning, what we're going to see is very important. Now, we have already studied the top of your box, so we're not going to pick apart all of these verses at the top. Notice with me in the box um, that's right there, we have Philippians chapter 1, verses 2, verse, excuse me, chapter 2, verses 1, 2, 3, and 4. We've kind of studied that, and I want us to review and kind of look at this. The background and text. For those of you that are new, this will help you. Number one, the Apostle Paul writes from prison in Rome to the church at Philippi. Philippi is the city in modern-day Greece. This is 2,000 years ago. Paul writes from Rome to the city of Philippi. Look at number two. Get ready to fill this in. Number two, he calls them to live. This is important. We talked about this several times. He calls them to live as citizens of what? Very good. He calls them to live as citizens of heaven instead of citizens of any earthly realm. He's saying, yes, you're in Philippi. Yes, you're under the control of the Romans. Yes, you're there. Some of you are even maybe Roman citizens. But the reality of the matter is, is that if you are in Christ, you belong to a much greater kingdom. So remember that and live like that. You see, that would be a good thing for us to remember in this room. If you call yourself a Christian, you don't live according to the earthly realm. You live according to the heavenly realm. We are called to live according to what God says is true, what God says is important, what God says is right. doesn't matter what everybody else says. It matters what God says. And that's what Paul is saying to the Philippian people. He's saying, church, don't forget that you're citizens of heaven. You've been bought with a price. You've been made a citizen of a different kingdom, and the kingdom is an eternal kingdom. It's not a kingdom that's going to pass away. You see, the Roman kingdom is gone. You say, well, Rome still exists and the country of Italy still exists. I would say yes, but it's nothing like the influence of the Roman uh, Empire. 
And it lasted, you know, some say a thousand years. It was actually not quite like that. But um, it, it had some duration that was very significant. No doubt that it affected the civilization of the world. But in fact, that kingdom is gone. And the kingdom of heaven remains. Look at number three. He call, he deals in his letter, he deals with the pain of their under or fill it in, persecution and the problem of their disunity. So we see him dealing with these two things. These are Christians that are being persecuted in Philippi. There's a lot of pressure upon them, but he also recognizes that it's not just trouble on the outside that the church has, but there's some trouble on the inside. There is, and this is so often the case. Now, Pastor Jason prayed about unity issues. Um, a couple of weeks ago, uh, when Alex preached on this, he talked about unity in 2020, and I'm going to really hit that again this morning because the text is hitting that. Some might be, that are new to us might think, oh boy, that church must have lots of unity problems. They're praying about it and preaching about it. <laughs> Let me tell you, friends, by God's grace, we are unified. By God's grace, there is great love for one another in this congregation. And there's not divisions and factions and sections and personalities and conflict. But the beauty, you know, you know how you stay that way? You stay in the Word. And you stay remembering the things that are important. So this is simply what the text is dealing with. And so we want to very carefully drink this in and allow this to come in to the way that we process all of God's Word with us. Now, notice here in verse uh, number four is this. Verses 1 through 11 may be considered the climax of the letter. So, this could be considered the pinnacle of the letter. In fact, fill this in, very important, this is our model for unity. So, sure, they had some persecution problems and they needed encouragement. They also had some unity problems, some disunity problems, and they needed to know what is the model on how to be unified? What, what can Paul say that helps them come back together in this? And what we see in this is it's the golden key to right relationships. And if you're taking notes, you can say somewhere in there, not just in church life. This, is, this message isn't just about your church life. The truth of this message translates out into all of life. The truth of this message is how to be a person who has right relationships with others. As so far as it depends upon you, if you will look and listen at these verses, if you will listen to this message this morning and allow the Holy Spirit speak, to speak to you, you will see how does a person, as much as it lies within their ability to have right relationships, how can they do that? Here is the key. This is better than anything you're going to hear from Dr. Phil. It's better than anything you're going to hear from What's her name? Oprah? And who else? I don't know who else. Certainly better than, never mind. Uh, I won't go in there. But this is the true key, and not from some personality on television, but from the eternal creator of the universe. This is what he says to us about how to have right relationships. And it's found in Christ's example, and it's found in his power. You see, his work is at, at, at work here. His, that's what it's doing. It's, it's his work on the cross, his work in overcoming death, his work in being raised from the dead that overcomes the lock of sin and disunity, first with God, but also with others. Now, I want us to read the text and just kind of start to get this a little bit. Look up there in verse 1, 2, 3, and 4. I do want us to remember that because that is the context. Now, now, the part that I've underlined is the part that we're studying this morning and a couple more times, but, but I want you to notice that we often quote verses 5 through 11. Verses 5 through 11 comes up a lot because it is part of these mind-blowing concepts that are there, big, huge issues about Christ. But if we always remove verses 5 through 11 from the context that it's being given, we will miss out a great deal on what God is saying to us about how to live in this life. So notice what he says there. As he goes into chapter 2, he kind of changes gears, and he says to, these, to this church that's having a little bit of trouble, so if there is any encouragement in Christ, 
any comfort from love, any participation in the Spirit, any affection and sympathy, complete my joy by being of the same mind, having the same love, being in full accord of one mind. See, verse 1 and 2, he's saying, look, if there's anything that's in you that's Christian, you claim to be Christians. If there's anything about you that's Christian, he's saying, you must stay together and be of one mind. Look at verse 3. It starts to talk about how that happens. Do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility count others more significant than yourselves. Verse 4, let each of you not look out for his own interests, not only for his own interests, but also to the interests of others. Now comes the example. In verse 5, have this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus, who though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped. But he emptied himself, but emptied himself by taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men, and being found in human form, he humbled himself by being obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Verse 9, therefore God has highly exalted him and bestowed upon him the name that is above every name, so that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of the Father. Now, of all of these verses, the most familiar verses to us is verse 10 and 11. In verse 10 and 11, we often look at that. We, we talk about the fact that one day every knee is going to bow and every tongue is going to confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of the Father. And that is, a, that is a, a glorious truth that is very, very powerful, that is really part of the apex of all of God's plan. But we also want to recognize that there's some other parts here that are very, very important. Those last verses that we just read, verses 5 through 11, is often called the hymn of Christ. The hymn, H-Y-M-N, the hymn of Christ. It's poetic. In fact, if you, if you can study Koine Greek and you look at that, you start to see that there's structures here that this is a poem. And so, in fact, as is often the case in the Scripture, we see perhaps, especially with Paul's letters, a song being entered into the letter. So it may have been a song that they would have recognized. It may have been one that outlines these things that we'll see and, and one that they would quickly see. Oh, we're supposed to be unified because this is what we really see all that is in Christ and we know this tune. Or it may be that this was for the first time being written in poetic form under the Apostle Paul's hand. However it goes, there is a poetry that's here, and it's because this is an outline of incredibly important truths. So, that next part is there. It outlines five what I call mind-blowing truths concerning Jesus. That We don't need to be super technical here. They're just mind-blowers. These should be big to you. When you start to look at this, then you start to understand how does God work and how has God been working in throughout all of human history and what is his grand plan for all of creation? What is his plan for you and how is he going to work in you? You need to start to have an appreciation for the grandeur of these thoughts. The first one is found in verse 5 and 6. Look what it says. Have this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus. And in fact, you notice I put some brackets out there to the side. And go ahead and fill these in. The upper bracket is this. Be united. Do you see that? Fill that in up to the right. Be united. And he's saying, don't be divided. Right? This isn't on the screen. It's just, you just listen. Be united. Don't be divided. And then how do you do that is verses 5 through 11. And that's the context of verses 5 through 11 is he's saying to us, don't allow division to destroy your life in your church. And here's how you do that. Since you have Christ, think and act like him. Look at verse 5. This is since you have in Christ. Have this mind among yourselves, and then look at that, what it says which is yours in Christ Jesus. 
And already up in verse 1, he's saying, look, if there's any, any bit of truth in you, if the Holy Spirit is in you, if all of these things are true, then do this. And here's what we see. You have Christ. And since you have Christ, the rest of it is think and act like him. What does he do? What does he think? How does he act? This is how we have right relationships with the people around us. So letter A is this. In these mind-blowing truths, I want you to see letter A is this. In first, in verse 6, we see Jesus, the pre-incarnate. Now, that's a big word for you, I know, but it's an important theological word that Christians ought to know. And so that's why we don't hesitate to share it with you. If you're new to us this morning, that's cool. Just kind of enter in. You'll get in the groove after a little while. Just notice this. Jesus is the pre-incarnate, eternal Son of God. Now, when we talk about incarnation, uh, let's, let's think about that a little bit. Pastor Billingsley used to always talk about chili con carne, right? He would, he would often say that. It's chili with what? Chili with meat. Let's even get more vivid. Chili with flesh, so you're going to eat chili with flesh, right? Ooh, that sounds gross. But no, it's, if it's a cow or something else, that's fine. So chili with flesh. It's, it's not just chili sauce and chili and beans. It is chili with meat in it because it has carne. It has flesh in it. That's what the word is. Carne has to do with meat or flesh. So if we talk about reincarnation, people of certain religions um, may believe that if you die, you are what? reincarnated into another form. So that means you come back into flesh in another way. And many would say, well, if you're bad in this life, you might come back as a mosquito or a beetle or a bug or a worm. And if you're good in this life, you'll come back as some more highly valued creature. That's reincarnation. So we, they use the same word in that, but far greater is this picture of Christ. And I, I, I just share that so that you can start to understand what do we mean when we say pre-incarnate? This means before the Son became flesh. What was He doing? You say, well, He came into existence when He was born, right? Wrong. That is a heresy. That is not true. In fact, all of Scripture shows us that Jesus was not created. He's never been created. He has always existed the Son has eternally existed from the Father. Eternally, the Father is emanating the Son. Eternally, the Son comes from the Father. Eternally, the Son glorifies the Father, and the Father glorifies the Son. And the same thing with the Holy Spirit. The beautiful Trinity of God, Father, Son, and Spirit, eternally exists in the happy, what we call the happy land of the Trinity, in perfect unison, in perfect unity in perfect exaltation of one another. We see this picture of the pre-incarnate Son of God, and we see it in verse 6. Look at verse 6. Look what it says. It's talking about Jesus, which is yours in Christ Jesus, who, speaking of Jesus, who though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be held on to or a thing to be grasped. So, Jesus, before he was born to Mary and Joseph, or really born to Mary as adopted son of Joseph, before he comes in the flesh, he existed with God. This is an important concept. You need to understand that this is God coming in the flesh. He was pre-incarnate the Son of God. Genesis 1, 26 and 27 says that the Lord said, let us make man in our image, plural usage of the reference to God. Jesus was at creation. The second person in the Trinity was at creation. In, first, or in John chapter 1, verses 1 through 5, go read John 1, 1 through 5. You will see, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was made flesh and dwelt among us. This is the picture of Jesus being in the beginning, the creation of all things He had created. So, letter A is the pre-incarnated Christ. Letter B is this, He comes in the flesh. And we looked at this a couple of weeks ago, but this, is, this all fits together. It's very important for us to see. So, in verse 6, he existed before he became a man. In verse 7, look what he does. But he emptied himself by taking the form of a servant and being what? Are y'all here? 
Look in the middle of verse 7. And being what? Born in the likeness of men. Now, this doesn't mean he stopped, become, stopped being God. He shed none of his deity. He still was in every way the God of the second person, the, the second person of the Trinity um, in, in his, in his uh, being. But we see that he lays aside his glory in that state to become a humble man. Now, this is amazing. This is a mind blower that the creator of the universe would become part of the creation. But that's what he does. And he doesn't just become part of the creation. He is born into a poor, humble nation that is rejected, a Jewish family. And he's, he's born. He doesn't show up in full, full form as a man. He shows up as a helpless babe. And all of this cries out and declares and vividly shows us the humility of God. So in his grandeur as creator, he also shows us the humility and the love in which he would come. But he's not just born as a man. Let her see. Jesus, as we see it in verse 8, Jesus' is humble obedience as the son to the father. This, look at verse 8 with me up there. And it says, in being found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient. So here he is, humble in his obedient, obedient in all things. He's obedient. This is as the son is to the father. We see this. The father is not greater, is not more uh, grand than um, the son, but we see this uh, father, son, and spirit, complete equals, but yet there is a submission that the son eternally has to the father to give him glory. And the father eternally exalts the son to give him glory. This is God's perfect exaltation of within himself. And we start to see it played out and we can start to understand it. Look at letter C, Jesus' humble obedience. And then letter D, we see in verse 8, Jesus' willing, sacrificial death as ransom for sinners. This is amazing. Look what it says in verse 8. And being found in human form, he humbled himself by being obedient to the point of death. That's amazing. But look at the next part. Even death on a cross. Friends, the Roman cross was the most humiliating, degradating way to kill someone. It was this idea. We as an empire completely reject you. And we are going to nail you to a cross cruelly and hold you up so that you can die a long, slow death in front of everyone. And we'll strip you naked in the process. So this was, this was about as, as absolutely rejecting that the world in the first century could be. There, there, there wouldn't be a better way to reject someone and show your disdain for them than to nail them to two pieces of wood nailed together and then lift them up and let them die a slow death. That means we completely and totally reject you. And that's exactly what God comes and does for us. God comes and says, you will completely reject me and I will love you still. So you cannot claim anything having to do of you saving yourself. It is me coming to save you who have so thoroughly rejected the creator of the universe. So his willing sacrificial death. And that's played out in the garden. He, we, we see that he submits to the Father willingly. Jesus, no one, Jesus would even say, no one takes my life from me. I lay it down. And after I lay it down, I will take it up. It's very, very clear that this was God's purposeful plan and that the Father and the Son are in unity on it. Those are mind-blowing concepts. Friends, I, I know that you've kind of heard that bits and pieces maybe all your life, but I hope you never get over it. I hope with each one of these, if you'll let it just kind of just really marinate with you. Look at the next one. Letter E. The Father's exaltation of the Son is seen here. And it's verses 9, 10, and 11. So look at verse 8. He's found in human form. He becomes obedient. What's at the end of verse 8? He what? 
He dies on a cross. And then look at verse 9. What does verse 9 begin with? Therefore. Therefore. Circle the word therefore. Why does God exalt him? God exalts him because he humbles himself. This is the picture. The father sees the son in perfect obedience lay down his life. And when the father sees the son lay down his life, the father, because of that, lifts him up and exalts him. Now, this is an extremely important thing for us to recognize. Notice the exaltation. Look at verse 9. Therefore, God has highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name that is above every name. Verse 10, so that at the name of Yeshua, or Yahweh saves, that's what that means. At the name, and very, his very function, the fact that God saves, at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus the Christ is Lord. He is curios. He is the Lord, the sovereign one, to the glory. Look what it says, to the glory of God the Father. Do you remember what I said? The Son is always glorifying the Father, and the Father is always glorifying the Son. This is perfect unity. There is a perfect submission of the Son to the Father, and there is a perfect oversight of the Father to the Son in loving guidance, in loving beauty. This is glorious. And what the amazing thing that we start to see is, is that God is all of this within himself, and he does all of this within himself, and he does it all for his glory and for our good. So that there is a way that we can be redeemed to him, that God would come and pay our sin debt himself. The one who didn't deserve to die would lay down his life and say, here is the perfect sacrifice, this is legitimate, to pay for your sins. And so we start to see that Paul, just look at that box up there at the top of the page, all those underlined verses is an outline. This is a beautiful outline of what he has done. And it's a beautiful outline that shows that it finally, it it starts with him before he becomes a man, he becomes a man, he humbly obeys, he dies a humble, humble, excruciating death, and then God exalts him. This is Jesus' resurrection, his ascension, and his reign and all of that. Don't miss that. At the end of letter E is, this is his reign. He, he, He reigns because... He has been exalted by the Father. Now, um, there's pre-incarnation, there's there's incarnation, and then it just, it kind of goes through a simple list. And and you can see that A, B, C, D, and E. It's It's a beautiful picture of that. But notice the next part here. Two key exhortations, strong recommendations that I would have for you. And so, what is an exhortation? It is a strong recommendation. It's maybe even a plea. So, in light of what we look at this, here's what I plead. Number one, don't miss the massive connection between verses 5 through 11 with verses 1 through 4. Now, this often happens because we focus on what Jesus did for us, and we, re- we recognize verses 5 through 11 are very, very important, and we recognize the importance of Christ being Lord over all, and so we proclaim that very, very often, but if we remove those from the context, here's what happens. We, we, we need to recognize that Christ reconciles us to God in part so we can be reconciled to each other. That is the context of Philippians chapter 2. The Philippians chapter 2 is dealing with people who are not in unity with one another. They're, they're, not in, they're, they're not one together. And so the way to help them get one is to help them really look at what Christ did to make them one with God. And he calls us not only to be one with God, to be right with God, but he calls us to be right with each other. And it's not a mere suggestion. It's a complete and total command, and this is the way 
of God. Notice the next part, number two. Don't miss the massive connection. Here's another connection. Don't miss the massive connection between humility and unity. Don't miss the massive connection between humility and unity. Humility is what opens the door for people to come together. What is the opposite of humility? Pride. Arrogance. What does pride do when it comes to other relationships? It pushes them away. How many of you just enjoy being around prideful people? You just really feel loved when you're with prideful people. Do you, do you feel loved when you're with prideful people? No. Prideful people, the, the picture is when we are prideful, we are selfish. We're, we're, we're thinking about our deal. We're thinking about what we want. We're thinking about our agenda. Not yours, not your good. We think about my own good. That's what happens when Andrew Coleman is prideful. That's what he's thinking about. And I, I, I want you to see that humility is what brings people together. And we see this, listen, on a cosmic level when you look at Philippians chapter 2, verses 5 through 11. We see ultimate humility of the ultimate God. And that ultimate humility does the ultimate reconciliation. I mean, there's been no treaty bigger than this one. There's been no peace accord that rivals this one. All of those are just pebbles compared to the monolithic mountain of the beautiful reconciliation between heaven and earth that Christ brings. This is the cosmic, beautiful restoration, and it happens through Christ's humility. Look at that first point there. Christ humbled himself completely to unify us to God. That's what you see in those verses. And we must humble ourselves before God to be unified to God. You see, no one can come to God unless they humble themselves. We're about to see that in James, but I, I just want you to see this, that this is where faith in Christ comes in. Mark chapter 1, Jesus begins his ministry by saying this, repent and believe the gospel. Repent and believe the truth. Repentance is humility. Repentance means I'm wrong. I'm doing the wrong thing. There are many who want to come to Christ, but they don't want to repent. They don't want to recognize that they have violated him, that they have sinned against him, that they, ha that they have lived in such a way that is not honoring to God. They, they say, well, I would like to add Jesus on top of my life. I just don't want him to be controlling my life. My friend, if, if that is your mind and heart, you cannot have Christ. You will never have Christ. But the way that we have Christ is that we recognize that He is God and we are not. That He is holy and we are not. And that if we have any hope, it's that He would give us His holiness. The way He gives you His holiness is by sending His Son to pay what you could never. You can never pay for your millions of sins. You could never do it. But the perfect sacrifice can. And that is how we come to Him. We must humble ourselves before God. Look at the last one there under the bottom of that. God greatly rewards faith-filled humi humility. He greatly rewards faith-filled humility. That's what He always does. Now, before you turn the page, look at verse 9. We talked about this. This is God's reward of Jesus. Because Jesus humbled himself to the point of death, even death on a cross. Look at verse 9. Look what it says. Let's read verse 9 out loud together. Verse 9. Are you ready? Therefore God has highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name that is above every name. You see, God rewards this humility. Look at verse 10. Look at read and read verse 10. So that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth. Keep going, verse 11. And every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. You see, that's ex exaltation. That is ultimate exaltation. He's made Lord. And so, this is what happens when humility comes. Now, God's not going to make you Lord to the glory of the Father, but He will make you one with the Lord 
who is the glory of the Father. Very quickly, turn your page, safe to do that now. I want you to notice a couple of things and share with you something that I've recently come to really appreciate. And James chapter 4, verses 1 through 10 is really an outline of what we've been saying. James was the first letter written to the churches, not Philippians. Philippians came 25 years later. But James is dealing with similar things. Look what he says in James chapter 4 and verse 1. He says, what causes quarrels and what causes fights among you? You could ask this about your own house, your own marriage, maybe your own work. Is it not this, that your passions are at war within you? He's saying that, you know, that, that there's this selfishness, there's this self-centeredness that you have or the people around you have. Verse 2, you desire and do not have, so you murder. You say, well, I haven't murdered anyone, but no, but you, you start to get the picture. You covet and cannot obtain, so you fight and quarrel. That means you just really want this. You do not have because you do not ask. You ask and do not receive because you ask wrongly to spend it on your passions. The whole point of all of this is your heart is in the wrong place. And look what he says in verse 4. We studied this a couple of years ago. You adulterous people. You see, you've gone out after another lover, not God. You adulterous people. Do you not know that friendship with the world is enmity or hatred? with God. Therefore, whoever wishes to be a friend of the world makes himself an enemy of God. Verse 5, or do you suppose it is to no purpose that the Scripture says he yearns jealousy, jealously over the Spirit that he has made to dwell within us? Notice verse 6, but he gives more grace. Therefore, therefore, it says, God opposes the proud but gives grace to the humble. There it is. Submit yourselves, therefore, to God. Resist the devil and he will flee from you. Verse 8, draw near to God and he will draw near to you. Cleanse your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. Be wretched and mourn and weep. Let your laughter be turned to mourning and your joy to gloom. Humble yourselves before the Lord and he will exalt you. Now, you say, well, does God not want us to laugh? Does God not want us to have the… He just wants us to mourn and gloom. Oh, he wants you to not laugh about your sin. He wants you to mourn over your sin. He wants you to realize that you have violated him. And so, you should have a gloomy heart when you consider your sin. If you do not have a gloomy heart, then you have not come rightly before God. This is what it means to come before a holy God, recognizing that you have offended him. So, dear friends, we are being called by James to come and do this, because if you will humble yourself, look what it says in verse 10, he will exalt you. That's what we just read in Philippians chapter 2 that Christ humbles himself to the cross and God raises him up from the dead and makes him Lord over heaven and earth. God never misses a reward. He always rewards his people. It, Hebrews eleven six, the last little part of that six, one of my favorite phrases, if you've been around here, you've heard me quote it many times, for the Lord is a rewarder of those who seek him. He always rewards those who seek him. You seek God, he will reward you. This is the way he works. So have you ever heard of a J-curve? I want to share this with you as we end. What is a J-curve? J-curves are kind of interesting. They're used in economics. They're used in political issues. They're used in marketing. They're used in a lot of different areas of life. And it's a very simple concept. Notice the screen in front of you. You see these, these curves. It, it first goes down, and then it goes up. And, and in fact, that is the key concept. I want you to see this. The key concept is this. The way up is down. So if you want to go up, you got to go down first. And we see this in Jesus' life. We see it very clearly in Jesus' life. First of all, Jesus leaves heaven and he comes to earth. And not only does he come to earth, he's 
born into the form of a baby, and he comes into a place of obedience and submission to the Father in this. And then what does he do? He lays down his life and he dies. And as the Father has always done, he exalts the humble. And so, as Jesus dies, Jesus is brought back. Jesus rises from the dead. Jesus rose from the dead, and he is exalted to the Father. Now, friends, I want to say to you that that is the same curve that works with us. The only difference is we're not the second person of the Trinity. We are to be saved by the second person of the Trinity, and the way that we can have a J curve is this is that we die with Jesus. We come to recognize that as Christ laid down his life, I lay down my life. As Christ laid down his life to set me free from the law of sin and death, I, by faith, leave all of my selfishness and I turn my hope to Christ. You say, well, that's my problem, Pastor. I can't become a Christian because I can't leave my selfishness. I would love to do that. I would love to come to one of these prayer pockets and pray with someone and receive Christ. But Pastor, I know I'll mess it up. I know I'll go back. I know that I will fail in this. Friend, what Christ calls you to do is look to Him, not yourself. You look at what He did, and you say, If he did that for me, I will trust in him. So just as you turn to him in your state of need, you cast your faith upon him. And that is what saves you. The faith that he will save you, not that you will save yourself. So friends, you come in we die with Christ, and by His promise, we rise with Jesus. Now, here's, here's a cool thing that you're going to see right here, and this is not on your outline, but notice the, notice the blue dotted line across that. That blue dotted line represents the waters of baptism. And the waters of baptism are, are every time we baptize someone, the picture is this, is that just as Jesus died and was laid in the tomb, that Andrew or Karen or S- Samantha is laid down in the water grave with Christ. And just as Jesus was risen from the dead, Samantha lives in Christ. That's why we confess our faith through baptism, is that we're saying, I surrender myself and all of my sin and all of my foolishness, and I surrender all of my hope to Christ and to Christ alone. And this is where I find my hope. This is where I find my life because it's in Christ. And the Bible tells us, as we're going to see in the coming weeks, that He not only is Lord of all things, but He invites us to reign with Him. If you've been missing Wednesday nights, I I feel bad for you. Wednesday nights are awesome. We've been looking at the hope of heaven, and we're going to look at it again this Wednesday night. I want to encourage you to come because it's directly related to this, the exaltation of Christ and all that God has in store for those who know Him. Just look at the J-curve. I know some of you folded it over, opened it up. Just look at that. Look at it. Jesus went to death for you. And Jesus rose again so that you too can rise again. The question is, have you identified yourself with Christ? How do you do that? You turn to him in belief and say, he is the hope, not me. He is the hope, not my godly grandmother, not my uncle the preacher, not my big tithe or my big thing, the Lottie Moon Christmas offering. That doesn't prove that you're a Christian. The only thing that proves that you're a Christian is the Holy Spirit coming to live within you. He is the seal of promise. My friend, I call upon you. I ask you, do you know that you know that you know that He has redeemed you? He will redeem you. He will redeem the most hardened skeptic if you will simply say yes to Him. Look at Galatians 2.20. This is glorious. It's at the bottom of your outline. It's on the screen in front of you. Notice this in light of the J curve. And I'm going to ask you to read it out loud with me. Galatians 2.20 captures this. It pictures this. Notice this. 
Paul writes these words and he says, I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. In the life I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. You see, it's not up to you. It is up to him all the way to heaven. So, friend, I call upon you to come, to run to Christ and say, oh, Lord God, unite me with you and unite me with your people. Let's pray.